Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's virtual launch of Jeremy, Mark, and Niels Graham's report titled Relying on Old Enemies, The Challenge of Taiwan's Economic Ties to China. My name is Colleen Cottle, Deputy Director of the Atlantic Council's Global China Hub, which devises allied solutions to the global challenges posed by China's rise. In doing so, it leverages the Atlantic Council's work on China across our 16 programs and centers. Taiwan is central to many discussions today about the future of East Asia, global supply chains, and the U.S.-China relationship. And it was high in the agenda of this Wednesday's meeting between President Biden and Chinese leader Xi Jinping. This international attention on Taiwan, however, tends to focus heavily on geopolitical and military issues. But the economic relationship between China and Taiwan, marked by a deep interdependence, is a critical piece of the picture. China is becoming more dependent on its business ties to Taiwan and on investment from Taiwan electronics manufacturers. This is particularly true amid its unprecedented economic downturn and as foreign multinationals begin to move their factories to other countries. Taiwan, for its part, relies heavily on exports to China. Its economy greatly benefited alongside the Chinese economy from the COVID-19 electronics boom. This uneasy mutual economic dependence is exacerbated by Taiwan's homegrown economic vulnerabilities, including an aging population and labor shortages. This deep codependence has served in a check, as a check on some of Beijing's economic coercion to date. However, Chinese leaders may decide in the future to sacrifice some of China's economic well being to put real coercive pressure on Taiwan. And Beijing has already been using its economic influence to exert pressure on Taiwan more indirectly, targeting Taiwan's international partners. Indeed, the hub has looked more closely at some of these practices in a report and launch event held earlier this month. The report is called Investigating China's Economic Coercion, the Role and Reach of Chinese Corporate Entities, and highlights the ways in which Beijing has accumulated leverage through corporate ownership to try to sway other countries' political decision-making, including on policies toward Taiwan. As Taiwan advances its own economic de-risking strategy toward China, the question becomes, how international partners can aid in this effort. The United States and its partners have a key role to play in that regard. They can help facilitate Taiwan's continued integration into the global economy and elevate Taiwan's economic standing in the Asia Pacific region. We've gathered an incredible group of experts today to discuss these issues and more at a pivotal time. Today's event comes on the heels of the Biden Xi summit and as Taiwan prepares for a critical presidential election in January. The campaign is heating up with an announcement just this week that the two main opposition parties, with both, which both pledged to resume talks with China, will form a joint presidential ticket. This marks part of an effort to try to dethrone the incumbent Democratic Progressive Party, portending potentially a shift to Taiwan and Taiwan's trajectory next year. To kick off our panel, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's event, Catherine Hill. Catherine is a Financial Times Greater China correspondent based in Taipei. After obtaining her master's degree in Chinese studies and German literature from the University of Hamburg, Catherine worked as the editor-in-chief of Asia Bridge. This is the leading German-speaking professional business magazine related to Asia markets. With 22 years of experience, she has also had an extensive career with the Financial Times. She first worked as a news editor and Asia editor for the Financial Times Deutschland. Then she served as the Taiwan correspondent, Beijing correspondent, and Moscow Bureau Chief of the Financial Times. Her work covers a variety of issues from geopolitics and trade disputes to foreign policy and Taiwanese domestic politics. Catherine, we are honored to have you here with us today. Over to you. Thank you so much, Colleen, for the kind words and for the extensive introduction. Um, I am really honored that to uh, mm, yeah, oversee this discussion today. and. Uh, let me jump right in and introduce um, the author of the paper we want to discuss uh, today and take as the kind of point of departure for a broader discussion. So uh, Jeremy Mark is a non-residential, um, non-resident senior fellow at the Geoeconomics Center at the uh, Atlantic Council. And um, he is a specialist in political, economic and financial issues. Uh, related to Asia and Africa, and he also uh, worked at the International Monetary Fund as a communication uh, specialist for more than uh, two decades before. Um, now, Jeremy, uh, these days, uh, every time I need to write about uh, Taiwan, which is uh, every other day, really, 
the the international discourse is completely focused on geopolitics and and uh, military issues and and sometimes even more narrowly on on uh, invasion scenarios. Uh, your paper is very different. It takes a tour of force uh, tour de force through Taiwan's economic relations with China and Taiwan's own domestic economic challenges, and it explores the mutual benefits and vulnerabilities uh, for the two sides uh, of the strait. So tell me, why did you pick this topic and why now? Well, Catherine, I think you're absolutely right that there's this tremendous focus uh, on uh, the threats to Taiwan, the military threats in Taiwan. But despite Beijing's uh, loud uh, uh, protests against anything Taiwan does that seems to move it away from eventual uh, reunification. And despite the inevitable alarm bells in Washington about this, I, I firmly believe that a military confrontation in the Taiwan Strait is not preordained. And I think it's because there are various other dynamics at, at work in this relationship, as has been the case really since the late 1980s. Uh, and one of them, the most important, is this economic codependence that has developed between Taiwan and China in recent years, which Colleen referred to. Uh, it, it's, it, it has become a, a relationship that is increasingly based on Taiwan's central role in semiconductor industry and electronic supply chains, all of which run through China. And I think it was time to uh, sort of dig a little deeper into this and what it means for Taiwan. And I would add that this could not have been possible without the work of my co-author, Niels Graham, who has brought great insights into Washington policy and extraordinary data crunching expertise to the work we did on this paper. Uh, I'm of too old a generation to run numbers like that. Uh, I, I would just add that you know what we are really looking at is how Taiwan's role in the region, Asia, and in the global economy may, may evolve in the years to come uh, because of its important role in semiconductors and in other areas. And basically, as Colleen touched on, we took the time to do something that a lot of other analysts haven't done, at least in the Washington think tank community, which is to assess the strengths and vulnerabilities of, of Taiwan's economy at this point, the particularly the degree to which uh, this heavy dependence on semiconductors may uh, actually restrict some of its freedom of, of, of movement in, in the future. Right. Um, uh, what, one uh, thing I'm really interested in is um, you, you have uh, quite, a, quite a wide range of, of well, uh, different parts of the economic landscape. And so you have uh, vulnerabilities, you have like this this um, um, delicate balance between Taiwan and China in, in the economic area. You also have a lot of domestic uh, economic structural uh, problems. And then you have the area of, of uh, Taiwan's exclusion from international uh, uh, trade agreements. Now, um, how taking all that together, like what kind of conclusion do you arrive at um, as to what the most important steps are uh, the Taiwanese government and other economic actors uh, should be taking to address Taiwan's vulnerabilities and make it more resilient? Well, this being a, a think tank paper, inevitably there have to be lots of recommendations. And uh, I'll I'll just touch on a couple. Uh, in terms of Taiwan's own domestic policy, there's a lot that has to be done, I think, to strengthen uh, its economy in the future. Basically, we've reached the point where exports of semiconductors have uh, equal about 25% of Taiwan's GDP. And the dynamism of the economy is very much centered on this one industry. Uh, that obviously is, is a great advantage at the moment, as we've seen, but it also, I think, presents a significant vulnerability. So Taiwan needs to make the policy changes to, to, to bring its, uh, its great innovative powers to bear on other related industries, AI, biotechnology, and others. That's one thing. I think Taiwan also needs to 
strengthen its efforts to broaden its trade and investment beyond China, which has been a central goal of the uh, Tsai Ing-wen's government over you know, since 2016. It, there's been a lot of, um, of talk of this, and there has clearly been movement, particularly in the realm of investment. But I think the government could do much more to encourage this by supporting trade, providing incentives for business to go abroad in both to trade and invest, and uh, specifically more support for companies that want to leave China. Uh, we also have area uh, recommendations related to the U.S., and I'll keep it real short here because you could get into this at great length. You know, the U.S. is unlikely to sign a free trade uh, agreement with Taiwan, which many people want, both in both capitals. And I found, looking at U.S. policy, that there that the overarching strategy for developing economic relations with Taiwan and encouraging its broaden the broadening of Taiwan's web of investment and trade. It is not really clear. The strategy has not been enunciated. And I think there's a lot more that the U.S. could could do to strengthen this, particularly because it's U.S. policy and U.S. leadership that will uh, give room for other governments that are interested in developing their economic relationship with Taiwan to advance in this area. Thanks very much, uh, Jeremy. Uh, we, we could um, talk a lot more about this paper, but uh, let me at this moment bring in our uh, panelists so we can have a bit of a broader uh, discussion. So, um, uh, first of all, um, we have I have with me today uh, Christy Xu, who is a, um, the director of the Taiwan ASEAN Studies uh, Center at the Zhonghua in, uh, Institution for Economic Research in in uh, Taiwan. Uh, she um, uh, looks at uh, Southeast Asian studies, regional economic integration. She also advises um, the Taiwanese government's external relations and economic and uh, uh, trade policy. Um, we also have uh, Peter Kurtz, uh, Chief Strategy Officer at QS, uh, QIC uh, International. Um, Peter uh, has been working on um, uh, on uh, uh, the fin in the financial industry uh, for almost 40 years and 35 of those uh, he spent uh, in Taiwan and last at, as uh, chairman of uh, Citigroup uh, Global Capital Markets uh, in Taiwan. Um, and last but not least, uh, uh, Shelley Rigger, um, Brown Professor of uh, East Asian Politics and Vice President for Academic Affairs and uh, Deans of Faculty at Davis, uh, Davidson College, and one of the really foremost experts on, on uh, Taiwan politics. Uh, now, uh, let me just very briefly um, uh, uh, explain the, um, the rundown. So we'll have a panel discussion for the next, well, half hour, a little bit less than that. And then we will open the floor uh, to audience, question, uh, audience questions. Uh, so for those who are watching or listening, uh, if you um, want to ask a question, you can input that question at the following web address. You, you go to askac.org and submit your question writing there. Um, now, with, without further ado, let's uh, jump right in. First, um, uh, Christy, we'll start with you, if you don't mind. Um, Please. So Jeremy in the paper describes this uh, codependent economic uh, relationship that ties China and Taiwan together, but he also outlines the forces that uh, uh, tear at this cross-strait economic uh, fabric. Can you walk us through uh, the genesis of this bilateral economic relationship? So uh, what's the trend line of Taiwanese uh, foreign direct investment in China and also um, bilateral trade, and what conclusion can we draw from macroeconomic figures? So if, if uh, we see an increasing or decreasing weight of, of China in Taiwan's exports or imports, does that tell us anything about Taiwan's increasing or decreasing dependence, economic dependence on China? Yeah, thank you very much for that question. And first of all, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I'll try to summarize the seven decade history uh, between Taiwan and China. So to basically the first four decades since 1949, there is no absolutely no three no's, no contact, no negotiation, no compromise, meaning no trade and no investment. And then since uh, late 1980s, 
uh, the KMT government uh, adopted a, new, a series of new policy to gradually relax restrictions against China. For example, to allow indirect trade and also indirect communication. But everything at that time has to be uh, via Hong Kong. And later on in 1991, uh, the KMT uh, government lifted the uh, investment ban to China. And so for the first time, Taiwanese company were allowed to directly invest in China. Later on, uh, the Taiwanese government aiming to prepare for Taiwan's membership for the WTO, the World Trade Organization, and inevitably uh, contact under the uh, WTO framework with China. Then the government reviewed all trade and investment policy and regulations on China and gradually removed unnecessary barriers or restrictions based on a case-by-case -case, uh, review. So uh, to be very quick, during the 30-some years of Taiwan's involving policy on economic relation with China, investment in China in the first 20 years reached an average growth rate of 15 to 20 percent uh, a year. And, and the annual FDI outflow from Taiwan to China reached a peak at 2010. Uh, when FDI, FDI in China accounted for over 85 percent of Taiwan's total uh, FDI outflow. And since then, the share and amount gradually reduced since 2015. Uh, annual FDI outflow in China declined to less than 10 billion US dollars. And then since 2018, uh, when a US China trade war uh, kind of re uh, erupt and then China's share declined to around one third. So uh, uh, for example, first uh, nine months this year, China's share declined to less than 20%. And in terms of cross-strait trade, China replaced the U.S. to become Taiwan's largest export destination in the year 2000. Five years later, in 2005, uh, the share of Taiwan's export to China and Hong Kong reached 40%. And then uh, it remained for 40% until last year. And then uh, in 2000, uh, 2013, China replaced Japan to become the largest import source for, for Taiwan. So uh, there are several milestones, including um, uh, Taiwan and China both entered the WTO in 2001 and 2002, which prepare direct uh, trade and investment relation under the WTO framework. And then the ECFA, probably we'll touch upon this later, uh, entering into force in the year 2010. And then the US-China trade conflict is another milestone, which totally changed the dynamics across the Taiwan Strait. So if you want, uh, me to answer the question whether Taiwan is uh, increasing or decreasing its dependence on China. Yes, in terms of investment, we are investing less and less, and we are diversifying all this new investment to other parts of the world, including Southeast Asia and the US and also EU. But in terms of trade, we are still very much dependent on Chinese market. Uh, having said that, because a Taiwanese uh, company now understand they have to diversify the market, but to diversify the market, it takes time. So it will need uh, five, eight years to see a more uh, diversified a trade a, a relation uh, between Taiwan and other parts of the world. So uh, in terms of trade, in terms of investment, we are approaching into different, uh, uh, different, uh, different uh, development, but Taiwanese under uh, companies understand they have to diversify to keep their uh, uh, resiliences. Over to you. Thank you. Um, now, after this this macroeconomic angle, Peter, I would like to turn to you. And and um, since you've got uh, a lot of experience dealing with uh, Taiwan corporates over the years and and uh, watching them, um, I wonder um, uh, what this uh, relationship looks like from, well, from the practical uh, perspective of, of companies. So one of the policies Jeremy uh, um, describes in the paper, which are aimed at reducing Taiwan's uh, economic dependency on China is a new southbound policy. So basically the attempt to shift economic uh, links and activity to Southeast Asia and India from, from China. Um, like from uh, from the ground and from the practical uh, realm, how do you think uh, does that work for companies? What kind of practical problems uh, do they have with that? And to what extent can these uh, this kind of government policy actually guide uh, where companies focus their economic activity? 
Well, thank you, Catherine. And again, a great pleasure to be a part of this uh, webinar uh, today. Um, let's maybe first start with the advantages that the Taiwanese corporates have uh, enjoyed uh, working out of the China uh, market. Uh, the obvious one is, of course, a common language, common cultural norms, and so it's very easy for Taiwan companies to manage the workforce in China, very easy for them to uh, deal with uh, government officials and adhere to uh, regulations and, and so forth. But perhaps even more important is the fact that China offers a very large, contiguous geography uh, into which to uh, place this uh, uh, electronics supply chain uh, from Shenzhen in the south all the way to Kunshan further north. Uh, the entire up to downstream uh, uh, chain is mostly there. Obviously, semiconductors still produced in Taiwan. Uh, and the thing with electronics industry is that it is ever changing. There's always new products out there, always requiring upgraded uh, components. And these um, supply chain players need to coordinate with each other in that upgrade to assure that they are reaching uh, the right price points, the right specs, the right quality, the right quantities, and so forth. Uh, and this requires a lot of interplay among uh, each company uh, in this, again, integrated supply chain. Uh, if you then try to take this monolithic uh, integrated uh, chain and then move it into Southeast Asia, you suddenly uh, find it's impossible to put that entire chain in Penang, in in uh, in Thailand, and so you would have to start crossing over into different uh, geographies as you move up and down that chain, uh, so that you're, you have to go through customs clearance, you have different tax policies, different currencies, different languages, and so forth, uh, and it suddenly becomes very difficult, very costly, and very inefficient. Uh, for these companies to operate in that space. I'll give you one anecdote. Uh, a uh, chairman of a uh, billion dollar, US dollar uh, uh, electronics company uh, told me that he's still debating whether he wants to adhere to this uh, uh, new southbound policy or, uh, and he is under a lot of pressure to do so, not from the government, mind you, but from his own customers. Uh, anyone who's supplying Apple, supplying Black & Decker, supplying Walmart, are all being faced with the same mandate to move their new production, their new products uh, outside of China, outside of Taiwan as well. As uh, Jeremy pointed out in this uh, piece, it's a sort of a greater China plus one policy now. Uh, and he's debating whether or not to uh, comply with that or simply forego the business opportunities that uh, is being uh, you know offered to him uh, simply because the cost of doing so uh, would be so high, his his profit margin would be squeezed in the, in the process, uh, and he basically is debating whether or not to simply wait it out and uh, hope that this uh, anti-China sentiment and this sort of Greater China Plus One strategy is 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 uh, basically uh, blow, blows over. Um, now, uh, this doesn't necessarily apply to the non-tech space. I mean, you do see a lot of uh, textile companies, footwear companies going into Indonesia, uh, even Cambodia, uh, even Myanmar. But um, again, for the Taiwan tech sector, which, as again, Jeremy pointed out, is a major portion of the Taiwan economy, roughly 60% of total exports, uh, it's going to be problematic and it's going to be slow. Uh, I also hear that other companies that are, again, trying to adhere to this policy are actually still doing most of their production in China uh, and shipping mostly finished goods to Southeast Asian markets uh, and basically maybe putting them in boxes or doing a little bit of additional work, but claiming that that meets that 30 percent uh, value add uh, required to get that sort of local content qualification. So again, a lot of pushback from the tech sector uh, to adhering to this. Um, I, ultimately, Taiwan investment is going to be covering, is going to be following uh, economics, uh, following their profit margins rather than following policy. Uh, and until uh, that these sort of supply chain uh, inefficiencies are worked out, uh, there's going to be continued pushback, I think, on this. 
And that's really fascinating. And th there would be so many points where I would love to drill down, but um, maybe we'll branch out into another area first. And uh, um, let's hear from Shelley. Now, um, we've looked at macroeconomics and the corporate sector, but uh, the one reason why we're, or the main reason why we're really looking at this uh, economic codependent relationship and vulnerabilities is 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 politics, right? And and so I'm I'm really um, uh, curious, Shelley, um, how you think uh, this um, relationship is impacting Taiwan socially and politically. Now, uh, Jeremy, I think. Um, uh, points out in the paper uh, that uh, some of China's economic coercion moves, um, such as trade bans, have been little little more than an annoyance for for Taiwan. But uh, uh, China has also been engaging in a much broader game of of sticks and carrots, and so there's um, there's certain um, attempts to lure uh, uh, economic constituencies like young Taiwanese students, professionals, um, uh, and so on, with preferential uh, policies or free visits. So um, what is your verdict on the results of these efforts? Do you think, have they influenced political attitudes at all? Like, and, and in general, like what, what's the impact on the politics of Taiwan of, of the economic factor? Where I think this relationship, the trade relationship, the investment relationship, really triggered a political, a strong political reaction in Taiwan was when what had been since the late 1980s, kind of a one-way straight, right? People went from Taiwan to the mainland, they opened businesses, they um, got jobs, they some of them um, set up homes and uh, sent their kids to school. As long as it was a one-way straight, I think it had very little effect on Taiwan's domestic politics beyond uh, kind of provoking a conversation. You know, is this uh, is this going to hollow out our economy? Is it safe for so many people from Taiwan to be traveling back and forth? But the uh, degree to which Taiwan itself was exposed to pressures from the mainland that increased gradually over time and so did not really provoke a, a very strong political reaction, although there was a conversation. Uh, instead, I think the, the real political um, momentum or dynamism in Taiwan is primarily domestic and primarily focused on how Taiwan should manage its relationship with the PRC. That changed in the late 19 or the late 2000s, early 2010s, when the policies of the Ma ying administration started to make it a two-way straight. So there were among the many agreements, the 23 agreements that the Ma administration signed with mainland China were a number of things that brought people and money and firms from the PRC into Taiwan. And that did provoke a strong political counter reaction. So people talk about the sunflower movement. And I think the sunflower movement is really uh, Taiwan society uh, the, the manifestation of the anxiety that was created when suddenly there were literally hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of PRC people in Taiwan, where two or three or five years earlier, there had been zero PRC people in Taiwan or only a handful. So I think what what troubles or what dis, uh, what activates the political reaction in Taiwan is less the economic activity that's happening in the mainland and more the possibility, which was pretty much cut off by the sunflower movement, right? A lot of that, um, a lot of the policies that were expected to increase the amount of PRC investment and the number of PRC people in Taiwan didn't go through. They weren't completed because of the political backlash in Taiwan. Um, 
And I think since that time also, and, you know, it's a little bit difficult to, to uh, untangle the, the various threads and influences on Taiwan domestic politics, but simultaneously with the backlash against opening Taiwan to the PRC, we also had the introduction of the Xi Jinping era. And when we talk about how young people in particular, people who are uh, targeted for recruitment into the PRC for job opportunities mainly, sometimes for study as well, uh, there's, a, there's a big difference between the kind of golden age of the Hu Jintao era when China was relatively open, uh, domestic policy around things like uh, freedom of speech or access to the internet, VPNs were uh, relatively relaxed. And where we are today after uh, more than two terms of the leadership of Xi Jinping, where the day-to-day uh, -day lives of PRC people are much more tightly controlled than in the past. The uh, information environment in mainland China is much more rigid and closed than it was in the past. And so what I would uh, observe about uh, the kinds of people that the PRC would like to attract to the mainland, back in the early 2000s, 2005, 2006, when I was doing research on youth in Taiwan, um, most of the young people I talked to said, you know, I would go to the mainland if I had a chance. It would be interesting. It's a place to develop myself. Most recently, when I was in Taiwan, also doing that kind of work in 2019, um, there was much, it was more like, if I have to, if that's the only place where I can get a job, then I will go. But I don't want to live there because it's not a free society. Um, you're under surveillance all the time. They check everything that's on your phone and you can't do anything without your phone. So I think it's really the, the change in the climate in China that has affected the willingness of Taiwanese uh, to, to move there for anything other than because I am the boss and I have to get this lower uh, price point, which I think Jeremy's, I mean, uh, Peter's exactly right about and Jeremy too. Um, and then as far as the domestic political considerations, I think what really set people off was uh, when when China arrived in Taiwan and they saw what the potential for that, that huge influx, the po huge potential influx of PRC money and people, what that could do to Taiwan's domestic economy. Fabulous. That was, that was really, uh, really great um, and really great overview. Now, um, when when I uh, read Jeremy's paper and, and still now after having finished that and, and listening to the discussion here, um, I really have one key question or maybe maybe two. Um, uh, Jeremy, you write in the paper that um, you describe the relationship as an uneasy economic equilibrium across the strait, and but you also say that it, it constrained or it used to constrain Beijing's worst impulses, um, which kind of suggests that uh, some codependency is is good for for Taiwan security. Uh, but then, um, on the other hand, we also search for ways of limiting Taiwan's uh, economic dependency on China. So I'm, I really want to know, like, how much uh, economic interdependence do you think is good and uh, to keep Taiwan safe? And and uh, related to that, what's the balance of power in this economic uh, relationship? Where where is it going? Is Taiwan like losing leverage or or gaining leverage? Um, and and again, how is that? impacting uh, Taiwan security. I mean, Jeremy, you could talk about that or anybody else who has views on that is also welcome to jump in, I think. Well, you could also write a paper on it. Um, yeah. Uh, look, let me take the second question first. Uh, you know, there's a, a, I think there's a general image in Washington of, of Taiwan being this, this little place that's threatened by China and it really has no no power and no agency in the relationship. And, and I think that that's, that's completely wrong. I, I have written at various points in the last three years that uh, 
Taiwan really has an has the upper hand in the economic relationship, and it has constrained China's behavior. All you have to do is look at at the the pinpricks of coercion that China has used in, in very volatile settings. For example, the Pelosi visit, where they basically targeted some seafood and and fruit exports instead of going after the core of the economic relationship. I think even with the U.S. restricting sales of semiconductors to China, you know, billions of dollars a month of chips are, are crossing the, the Taiwan Strait, and China needs that. It needs it tremendously and will continue, although that could change in the coming years. So Taiwan has this advantage. And I think that, you know, the term guardrails is overused in anything to do with relations with China. But I do think that this trade has provided guardrails uh, in, in the overall dynamic in the in the Taiwan Strait. But it, I, I, there is room for Taiwan to diversify uh, its economic relations and to strengthen its ties, its political ties elsewhere in Asia and elsewhere in the world. And that, I think, will shift the balance. But if given what Peter is saying, which I firmly agree with, that that the economic uh, ties will, will, and Christie said it, I, I'm sorry, uh, that economic ties will not uh, shift too far away from this strong relationship, I think that that it's it's possible for Taiwan to begin to shift the balance. Right. Um, yeah. Does anybody else have any uh, views on this? Otherwise, um, I think we might um, want to uh, move on to the audience Q&A because we, we have quite a few questions there. Yeah, maybe let's uh, let's just do that. Yeah, Christy, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I just want to uh, uh, comment a bit on your question that um, um, this mutual dependence between Taiwan and China, I mean, whether what's the impact for the uh, bilateral relationship and what's the impact for, for, time, uh, for China? And yes, um, the uh, dependence on China is actually the top uh, the priority concern for Taiwan for Taiwan government, it's a national security uh, a challenge. But as for China, yes, China depends very much on Taiwan's um, semiconductor and other and other other uh, semiconductor uh, and also uh, the components, etc. But uh, economic dependence is never um, China's priority because it. If it considered that Taiwan is violating uh, the one China policy and all kinds of red line, I mean, economic dependence is never one of their concerns. Besides that, they are quickly developing their, for example, uh, mature chips or the commodity chips. And it is estimated that um, um, in the next two, three years, China is going to supply more of the mature uh, semiconductors to its own market. Therefore, I don't think economic security uh, 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 for China, it's um, dependence on uh, Taiwan is going to um, 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 significantly change its policy or change its stance on Taiwan. Thank you. Yeah, that's, uh, that's actually a very, very good point. Um, uh, so now we've got a number of uh, we we had a number of other questions I would like to um, have liked to address, but let's move on to the audience questions. There seems to be quite a lot of interest in in trade, actually. So first, we have from from Matt Giracci, um the question: Although new comprehensive free trade agreements are likely not on the table right now with the U.S. or other countries. Uh, Taiwan has managed to sign a small number of economic cooperation agreements with a small number of other countries like New Zealand. Are less comprehensive bilateral trade agreements feasible? And if so, what are the main areas they would cover? In this vein, uh, do you see the US-Taiwan trade initiative being built out further down the road? Um, who wants to take that? <laughs> Yeah, it seems that 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 would be one of one for you again, Christy. Um, yes, um, Taiwan has find it very challenging to uh, develop um, FTA with other countries. I mean, um, so apart from the uh, countries that we have diplomatic relation and we only have um, 
uh, the uh, 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 one with New Zealand and one with uh, Singapore. And China also changed its policy. For example, before earlier, when China tried to seize the diplomatic airline from, time, from Taiwan, they tried to uh, continue the FTA we have with our former airline. For example, uh, we, still, uh, we still have our FTA uh, enforced with Panama. But when China in uh, 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 the past few years uh, trying to uh, cut off our relations with some of our uh, former diploma uh, diplomatic ally, they forced them to um, uni uh, unilaterally um, cease the effects of the uh, 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 FTA with Taiwan. So right now we are losing FTA as well as losing uh, diplomatic ally. So uh, Taiwan tries very hard to develop other other forms of or other kinds of a trade agreement because we understand that for the United States the uh, uh, F, uh, FTA or trade agreement with market access is not popular anymore so we try to um, put in all kinds of significant um, areas or issues that we can develop which may indirectly or directly lead to enhance or strengthen a partnership. I think that is right now uh, the more uh, important goal for Taiwan, such as a supply chain partnership and such as, for example, coordination of policies um, for, on labor issues, on standard issue. I think that will be one of the approach Taiwan is going to have with most of the other uh, larger uh, trading partner. But we do understand that having bilateral uh, uh, trade agreement is still very challenging. So the government right now put a lot of emphasis on the um, on the access to the CPTPP. So we apply for the membership uh, two years ago. How, uh, how, however, we're still waiting for CPTPP members to reach the consensus as to how they are going to handle Taiwan's application as well as China's application. But we know it's going to be uh, very, very challenging. Thank you. Okay, um, there is a question. Yeah, this might be one of one for you, Peter, I think. So Emmett Stern is asking, uh, Taiwan has been attempting to pivot off of a semiconductor-based economy since President Li Denghui's uh, tenure. Uh, what condition has changed to make this a more plausible endeavor now? Yes, <clears throat> yeah, I've often said that Taiwan suffers uh, uh, to some extent to a, a Dutch disease type of situation because of the success of the semiconductor industry uh, and of course TSMC in particular, it's uh, taken a lot of the uh, computing uh, young talent um, uh, off the market for other industries, other companies to, to, uh, to uh, wean Taiwan's dependence away from the semiconductor industry. Uh, there's been a lot of hand-wringing in Taiwan over this pressure put on Taiwan or TSMC in particular to begin to move their facilities out of Taiwan into obviously Arizona, to Germany, into, into Japan. Actually, I think this is a very positive development. Uh, first of all, it makes TSMC uh, a more uh, reliable supplier uh, to the rest of the world and, and only further solidifies their position and leadership in, in the semiconductor sector. Uh, but it does reduce the burden on the domestic market to continue to supply the talent pool to TSMC and allow other industries to uh, uh, emerge. And we are beginning to see that, particularly in the software sector. Uh, and as uh, Jeremy mentioned earlier, also the biotech sector as well. But they're starting from a very small base uh, and can't compare uh, and in any sense to the scale that the semiconductor uh, industry uh, still wields. Um, and of course, what's happened now was we were beginning to see a maturation of the entire electronics industry, uh, including even TSMC, until this AI uh, 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 trend began to, to play out. Uh, and uh, now suddenly there is this new surge. And this is again getting back to that uh, discussion on supply chain as well. It now needs even more to be integrated and working to uh, adopt and absorb these new technologies and, and make them more efficiently implemented in the supply chain. Uh, so uh, nonetheless, uh, we are beginning to see uh, some weaning uh, from uh, the tech semiconductor industry, uh, but more from this trend toward internationalization than any change in the overall industry dynamics. Uh, okay, we have 
um, another uh, trade question or, well, it, it starts with trade and then goes into everything else. So Tina Zhong, a reporter at the Voice of America Chinese branch is asking, uh, well, each panelist actually, uh, on Chinese economic coercion, there are speculations that Beijing might use ECFA, so that's the Economic uh, Cooperation Framework Agreement, uh, as a tool to force Taiwan's new government, whichever party wins next year's election, to develop policies to its liking. How does each panelist assess the prospect for cross-strait relations after the elections, economic or otherwise? If the KMT-TPP joint ticket wins, uh, could Taiwan reopen negotiations on the services and trade agreement with China? Um, well, who wants to take that? That's a big one. Shelley, do you want to make a few predictions here? No, absolutely not. No predictions from, from a political scientist. Um, you know, uh, economists make their predictive models and um, we really try hard to not to. Um, I, what I would say though, is that the cross-trade services trade agreement was the agreement ultimately. And, and I won't say that it was anything particularly toxic about that agreement per se, but it was the straw that broke the camel's back in 2014. And I think there is a pretty strong immune response to it in uh, Taiwan's body politic. So I think it's very interesting that candidates are talking about it as something to bring back. I think they're they are tapping into some dissatisfaction with the economic situation in Taiwan today and imagining that um, they can sort of reawaken this um, more optimistic outlook that existed around 2008 to 2010 about how improving relations with the PRC might actually um, inject some um, momentum into the Taiwanese economy. I think that's a that's a fairly risky assumption to make that uh, voters will go for that. Um, and I also think that some of the things that Peter has been saying are really important. Um, in the last, say, five years, if you went to an investor conference about Taiwan, you would have had a uh, couple of years where everybody talked about the Apple supply chain, the Apple supply chain, the Apple supply chain, everything in the Apple supply chain. Then the Apple supply chain would have kind of gone down and the presentation would have come up with semiconductor, 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 TSMC, TSMC, semiconductor. If you go to an investor conference in Taiwan right now, you will hear about artificial intelligence, NVIDIA, the uh, AI supply chain, which is not just semiconductors, it's all of the equipment, the switching, the fans, the, the racks that they sit on. There is a massive amount of stuff that you need to set up high performance computing. And an awful lot of it is made by Taiwanese companies. And at the high end, a lot of it is made in Taiwan. So I agree with Peter that, um, you know, the, the kind of uh, maturing of semiconductor is good for Taiwan's high tech workforce to be able to sort of proliferate out into new lines of business. Um, but I also think it's worth noting that this is happening. And, you know, the, the perpetual prediction about Taiwan is that um, it's peaked. And there's nothing in the there's nothing next, you know, there's no next industry, there's no next wave for Taiwan. And that was true in the 1980s when we, we thought the economy was going to hollow out when traditional manufacturing went to the mainland. It was true when the Apple supply chain became not, you know, very profitable. And that, I, you know, you have to stay in the mainland to do that kind of work because it's an entire business model based on the nature of the Chinese labor market. Um, and then it was, you know, semiconductors. You got what? What's Taiwan going to do after semiconductors? Well, Taiwan has stuff to do after semiconductors. So, you know, I think the kind of built-in pessimism about the Taiwanese economy is very healthy in the sense that it it motivates people to do better. Um, but I also think it uh, tends to mislead uh, foreigners who see who hear those um, pessimistic stories and don't necessarily see the big picture. 
Yeah, that was an admirable uh, pivot by a, a political scientist into economics, but really, really interesting. Um, we Our next question comes from uh, Kitch Liao of, of the Atlantic Council uh, Global China Hub. And um, he asks about uh, economic coercion. And if I may, I'd actually like to tie that together with the question I wanted to ask earlier, but didn't get to. So he uh, Kitch asked what future economic coercive measures could China potentially leverage against Taiwan? And would they be effective in changing sentiments towards China uh, for the people of Taiwan? And um, there's actually some economic coercion uh, going on right now during the election campaign, which is an investigation China has, um, has started into um, uh, what they call uh, trade barriers against Chinese imports uh, imposed by by Taiwan, and the investigation uh, is um, scheduled to run uh, uh, through uh, January twelfth, so the eve of the election. And, and my, I, I would have liked uh, to ask um, uh, Christy also what that investigation might do to ECFA. So maybe, Christy, you can take both of those and, and speculate a little bit about future economic coercion, also address the, the impact of, of this um, investigation. Okay, uh, just a quick response to earlier question, whether economic coercion may affect the um, the election. So if you look at the election in Taiwan in 2016 and 2020, so uh, China's economic coercion never really worked because uh, we have these two elections already already there. And then, um, yes, China is uh, threatening to, uh, first of all, to uh, unilaterally seize, um, uh, uh, seize or call off the ECFA. And secondly, uh, they are doing this overall comprehensive trade barrier investigation and then uh, uh, probably a day before the election or probably after election, they may announce their results and then come to some uh, some some concrete action. Uh, uh, people here are guessing what kind of um, uh, future development China might have. So uh, the overall guess is that uh, China may announce the outcome of the investigation a day before the election but they may, they uh, very likely will not announce what they are going to do with the uh, outcome. And definitely the outcome they are going to have is that Taiwan is imposing unfair and trade uh, trade barriers to China, which violates the WTO uh, principle. And then uh, China, after announcing the outcomes of the investigation, may wait and announce further action after the election or even before May 20 when the new uh, president uh, takes office or they may not announce anything, anything. However, uh, it's likely that um, China may cease, uh, may take back some of the preferential uh, uh, tariffs they uh, apply, uh, they provide to uh, several hundreds, uh, to several hundreds of uh, products under the early harvest, which means that they may choose certain items, machinery, hand tool, to take back their uh, zero tariff treatment. So uh, this kind of products may be uh, suffering because they may, uh, they cease to have enjoyed the tariff, uh, the, the, the zero tariff, and they are not uh, likely to compete with the other competitor. But uh, we don't think that China is to uh, unilaterally call off the overall ECPA because uh, for ECPA, they have early harvest uh, tariff treatment. They also have this kind of um, mechanism to uh, uh, between two government. So uh, we, we believe that they may likely to maintain the uh, overall ECPA so that someday they may come back to uh, uh, continue talks and conversation with Taiwan government, but they may very likely to uh, choose or select some of the products to um, to uh, cut off their uh, zero tariff uh, zero tariff uh, treatment. So that may be the development. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, I'm afraid we we don't have any more time left for to for taking other questions from the audience we we've got some 3 minutes uh, left so i wanted to ask our panelists is is there anything you think uh, we haven't tackled or anything you would really have liked to say or to uh, contribute to the discussion and didn't get to uh 
Well, if I may, I just wanted to um, uh, add the comment that uh, we've, we've passed a milestone uh, more recently where Taiwan's per capita income has exceeded that of Korea. Uh, and it's done so uh, after 20 years of, of lagging Korea's development. Uh, and we've done so in, in large part, I think, in, by playing a complementary role to China rather than um, uh, competing in the same industries uh, that uh, Korea had. Uh, their policy was to move into the same big industries, such as flat panel displays, automobiles, uh, and, and memory chips uh, to compete against Japan and did very effectively uh, steal a lot of business away from them. But now China is moving into that same space. Uh, and so Taiwan, by playing a more complementary role uh, with uh, China, has been able to uh, avoid uh, that that head-to-head -head competition and continues to benefit from it. Yeah. Can I add, can I add one quick point um, to this? I think that there are forces at play right now in the global economy that are going to be drawing Taiwan further away from, from China, that, that any policy China uh, pursues is unlikely to have a significant impact. We're talking about the cost the cost differentials, the higher labor costs in China, the fact that businesses are increasingly uncomfortable with the economic policies that the that Xi Jinping's government is pursuing, uh, which, uh, despite the the smiling diplomacy of the past few days, uh, seem to be pretty firmly entrenched, and the overall decline in U.S.-China relationships that make multinationals, including Taiwanese companies, increasingly uncomfortable with the the business environment in China. Uh, and all of this suggests that that uh, you know there will be a continued movement of companies out of China and a shift of trade relations elsewhere. Fabulous. I think this is a a, a good point at which to wrap up. Uh, um, let me um, thank our panelists and our uh, uh, author, of course, uh, so much for your time and your your uh, great contributions. I I think this was uh, really a fabulous contribution to the debate at this point in time. And um, yeah, I'd love to do something like this again uh, with you sometime. And also many thanks uh, to the Atlantic Council for hosting us. Uh, have a nice day and have a nice evening. Right.